I told him I had limited time, so he couldn't go off script for too, <laughs> for too long. <laughs> Good morning. It's a Good pleasure morning. to be with you. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. Did I just say that at Wheaton College? <laughs> I did. These shocking words were spoken to me during a moment of academic paralysis by my mentor in seminary, a female Hebrew professor and also Wheaton alum. And I, just as perhaps many of you right now, revolted at these words. Everything within me protested. Because my mantra growing up was the very opposite. If it's worth doing, it must be done perfectly, right? I'm, I'm an only child. I'm the daughter of two firstborn parents. I was destined for perfectionism. <laughs> so, so what was her point? Was her point that excellence doesn't matter or that we shouldn't give our best efforts? Of course not. Her point was simply that something worth doing is worth doing no matter how much you have to give it. That something of a good thing is better than nothing at all. Really, she was saying that faithfulness is not always defined in terms of perfection, and actually, it rarely is. She was confronting, even exposing in me, my expectation of perfection and my even deeper fear of vulnerability. Why do I share this with you this morning? Because many of us here, I believe, are plagued by performance and perfectionism in all of its various forms. Yeah, yeah. And when faced with the reality of our shortcomings, our struggles, our limitations, we often despair, we hide, we compensate, we posture, we deny, we project false confidence. We value being strong and capable and competent. We don't like feeling weak. And we want others to see us in that light. We have imposter syndrome. Like I have a husband who thinks I'm way cooler than I actually am. <laughs> he didn't know I was gonna say that, so he set me up really nice there. <laughs> um, we fear our weaknesses. In fact, we often despise our very humanity because it holds us back from being superhuman, or shall we say, from being God. I've actually been having this conversation with students a lot lately. The problem is I'm human, right? And yet, it's in our very humanity that Jesus, who took on our full humanity, calls us to be his disciples. So this is part of discipleship. So how should we respond when faced with the reality of our weaknesses and limitations? Are any of you feeling weak this morning, especially at the start of this new semester? Paul addressed this very question in his second letter to the Corinthians. I know it's been read, but if you have your Bibles, I would love you to turn there and look with me. Don't just take my word for it. So please turn, if you have, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, and the passage just read. In these verses, Paul is essentially taking on his critics, those who question his credibility. It's in this context of defending his apostolic authority and completely redefining the Corinthians' view of strength in terms of the cross of Christ that Paul gives us this account of his thorn in the flesh. Yes. And through Paul's experience, we receive needed perspective on how to view our own weaknesses as well. And this is a message that I need to hear often, and I'm guessing that you do too. So first, we see that Paul acknowledges his thorn. He admits his weakness. Acknowledge your thorn, verse 7. Paul's thorn here is not specifically identified, but we know a few things about it. First, the very imagery of the thorn tells us this was something really significant. It wasn't something trivial or a mere nuisance. Consider the picture of the crown of thorns that was worn by our Lord Jesus Christ. The verb tense expresses that it was intermittent. It was intermittent, but also ongoing in duration. It continually recurred and it buffeted or harassed him. It's the language of boxing or being beaten in the head or taking blows to the head. The word has the idea of to beat or to strike sharply with the hand or fist 
or more broadly, the idea of, of harassing or tormenting or treating something roughly and causing physical pain. So put simply, Paul's thorn beat him up. It tormented him. So the thorn was an intermittent and nagging source of distress, frustration, and torment for Paul. Bob might compare that to being a Chicago Bears or Cubs fan, but certainly that doesn't do justice to what Paul is describing here. Um, think of a nagging or hampering injury, one that flares up perhaps when you try to run and causes you pain and impedes your progress and keeps you from meeting your physical fitness goals or from running your race or from playing in the next game. It's something that, while not a constant source of discomfort, is always with you, a constant reminder of your frailty and your limitations. Mm -hmm. Think of a really, really sharp splinter lodged in your foot. Sometimes the pain is just dull, but other times when you step on it just right, the pain is acute. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine such a splinter so deeply embedded that you could never remove it. That's Paul's imagery here. And actually, we see in verse 8 that Paul actively resists his thorn and pleads with the Lord for its removal. That's how severe and frustrating and debilitating it was. And Paul was a pretty tough guy. Think of the list of things he went through in 2 Corinthians 11. So for those of you who think this doesn't apply to you, <laughs> Paul himself found himself as such a tough man of God in this position of pleading for its removal. Note the honesty and vulnerability of Paul's prayer in verse 8. Three times, it says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. It's emphatic in the original language. He actively pleads with the Lord. And yet the request for the removal in this case was denied. It was denied. Paul's request for divine surgery was denied. Perhaps there's a parallel here with Jesus' own request in Gethsemane for the cup to be removed. What was Paul's thorn? Well, there's a lot of interesting speculation on this question. I will not regale you with all of the options, but it could have been a few things. It could have been physical, his eyesight, perhaps his appearance, Maybe with the language of buffeting, it could have been headaches or migraines. We know in Galatians 4.13 that he acknowledges a bodily ailment that besets him. Maybe it was something visible that the Corinthians could see in Paul and, and scorned in him. Or maybe it was circumstantial, the long list of things, again, that we see he experienced in chapter 11. Or maybe it was spiritual or moral, guilt from his past persecution of Jesus Christ or a certain temptation that he battled. Or perhaps relational, Paul's opponents, those who caused him much grief. Given the language used here, I tend to think that it was something physical, but Whatever the source, it was something that Paul identified with his weakness. Many people think that Paul is intentionally vague here, so this, the thorn can be applied for others beyond his own circumstances. Maybe it was just obvious to the readers, but in either case, Paul's ambiguity here opens up a bridge for us and for Christ's followers throughout the generations to, who've been able to identify Paul's thorn with their own. So what is your thorn this morning? Perhaps it's something long-term, like Paul describes here, a defining or crippling weakness, maybe chronic pain or some physical or mental issue, a pain from the past that lingers, a particular area of temptation or pattern of behavior that you continue to battle, maybe something relational, like family or a difficult marriage, or persistent doubts or an ongoing battle with depression or mental illness. There are a lot of things that we could fill in here. I'm certainly not exhaustive in that list. Or maybe it's more circumstantial, um, not something long-term, but it's a present thorn. Not always there, but right now, a present burden or limitation for you, maybe even in your circumstances this semester. Your thorn is that persistent reality that reveals your weakness and brings you to your knees in dependence. Some of us this morning need to acknowledge the reality of our thorns, to be honest with ourselves, with one another, and with the Lord, to confront our perception of strength, to lay aside the masks of prideful self-sufficiency and our fear of exposure, 
to plead with the Lord in our pain. What is your thorn this morning? So we see that our first response to our weaknesses is simply to acknowledge our thorns. Sounds easy, but sometimes the first step is the hardest, and for some of you, that acknowledgement is the most difficult thing. For me, that was a major threshold in my mid-20s um, and a major marker in my life of discipleship in walking with Christ. So acknowledge the first. The second, we recognize God's purpose in our thorn. We see God's purpose in our thorns, that weakness cultivates humble reliance on the grace of God. We see this in verses 8 and 9. You see, there's a specific purpose for Paul's thorn. He states it twice and again emphatically. Therefore, in order that, that I might not exalt myself or be conceited, his thorn is to keep him humble to keep him from arrogance or from self-exaltation. This was in response to the surpassingly amazing vision that he had received from the Lord in verses one through five. And lest he fall into the trappings of pride, the thorn was to keep Paul humble. Yes. So who gave the thorn? Little interesting question here, Satan or God? <laughs> We're told in verse seven, it's a messenger of Satan. Mm -hmm. But humility, in Paul doesn't seem like a very satanic purpose, right? Um, humility in Paul is God's purpose, not the enemy's. So this idea of was given me probably is a, a divine passive here. The thorn is given from God in order to keep Paul from pride. The thorn is from God, but also used by Satan, simultaneously a gift from God that deflated his pride and a tool of Satan that afflicted him. Perhaps this thorn in some way hindered Paul's work for the gospel. But we see in Paul's thorn two purposes simultaneously at work. God's purpose to cultivate humility and dependence, and Satan's purpose in using that thorn to discourage Paul and to thwart his ministry. But God has an even bigger purpose here than simply Paul's humility. Because instead of removal, as Paul requests, the Lord instead responds with the resources to endure it, his grace and his power, to be fully showcased in the sphere of Paul's weakness. In verse 9, the Lord now speaks. He speaks personally into Paul's circumstances. My grace, my power is perfected. Power and grace describe God's ongoing gift of enablement for Paul to fulfill his calling to serve and suffer for Christ. This language of sufficient is actually the idea of enough, also emphatic. There's a lot of emphatic in this text if you study it in the original language. The idea here is enough is my grace for you. Enough is my grace for you. This wasn't the self-sufficiency of popular Greek Stoic philosophy, a form, again, of self-sufficiency or inner freedom to endure trials well. It was the very opposite of that, actually, because in himself, Paul is weak. His sufficiency comes solely from God's gracious provision. God's power is perfected, that is, it's fully realized, it's made fully present in the sphere of Paul's weakness. And our weakness puts Christ's power in stark relief and serves as the backdrop for his glory. Yes. Why? Because our weakness drives us to our knees in humble dependence, and he alone gets the credit. So he writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay yes. to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So Bob here um, benches a lot of weight. In fact, he bench presses about 460 pounds. I wanted to make sure I got that number right, so shout out for Bob. And, and I remember back in the day, it's been a few days ago, uh, trying to bench with Bob as my spotter. And he was determined that I would max out in one rep and made me try to bench 100 pounds, of course, with him spotting me. So upon removing the bar and bringing it down, my arms collapsed beneath the weight. 
that bar was not going anywhere up. <laughs> And I was forced in that moment of utter helplessness to recognize my weakness and my incapacity. And yet in that very moment of collapse, Bob placed his hands beneath the bar and then told me to push. With him supporting it and helping lift the weight. And all of a sudden, that bar of 100 pounds <laughs> was going up. You see, Bob's strength entered into the place of my weakness. Yeah. It enabled me to lift the very thing that previously crushed me, literally crushed me. I could have dropped the whole thing on my chest. <laughs> I never, I, <laughs> I never could have lifted that weight in my own strength. And in a similar way, Paul initially did not see the spiritual value in his, in his thorn, Sometimes when God does not remove the thorn in answer to our prayers, it is because he wants to give you more of himself, his very presence and his power to endure. So often what we need is not relief from our circumstances, but a revelation of the Lord's grace and power in those circumstances. My friends, your thorn is forming you. Your thorn is forming you. It's softening the stubborn tissue of your flesh to rely more fully on Christ and deflating your tendency to self-exaltation. Wow. And some of us need a new perspective on our thorn this morning. So God's specific purpose in Paul's thorn was to cultivate humility and to pour his grace and his power into that hollowed out space. <laughs> And when Paul begins to recognize God's purpose in his thorn, that Christ's answer far surpassed his own request, his perspective on his thorn radically changes. Now he actually boasts and delights in his weakness. So having acknowledged our thorns and recognized God's purpose, the last step is to embrace our weakness. We respond by embracing our weakness as the ground of Christ's power and glory. We embrace the reality of Christ's sufficiency in our weakness. You see, your weakness, my weakness, is ground zero, like the epicenter of a major explosion, for the demonstration and manifestation or the showcasing of Christ's resurrection power and glory through the most unlikely of channels. In verse 9, <clears throat> Paul takes an unlikely turn using the language of boasting. He embraces his thorn. He even boasts in it. And he doesn't boast by the world standards in wealth or status or rhetorical skill or power. Instead, Paul turns boasting completely on its head and makes his very weakness the object of his boasting. His language here is superlative. Gladly, all the more, I will boast. It's actually the language of elation, quite a contrast from verses 7 and 8. Uh, that's not my natural inclination. I don't know about you <laughs> this morning. Um, we want to present our perceived strengths as the instruments of God's power. That's where God will use me. But God often wants to use us in the sphere of our greatest dependence, where we have nothing and we know it. <clears throat> and Paul now moves beyond the thorn in verse 10. In verse 10, he actually extends this boasting to all of his experiences of weakness and suffering and hardships that he endured. He even includes in verse 10 some of the personal opposition and insults that he receives from the Lord. So now he just extends his boasting to everything, a whole long laundry list of his weaknesses. And it's not just that he's merely content. You know, the ESV says content. It's not really a strong enough word here. He actually delights. It's the language of delight. Paul's despair has become delight. Why? Because Christ's power may come to rest upon or dwell on him in this place. That's what he says in verse 10. He now agrees with Christ. So Christ has spoken, and now Paul agrees with Christ. When I am weak, then I am strong. Now hear me carefully. Paul's not a masochist. He's not seeking out suffering for its own sake. 
but he recognizes that his experience of weakness and suffering in all of its forms is a pathway for Christ's power in his life, and so he embraces it. He doesn't shun vulner vulnerability. Uh -huh. He doesn't shun uncomfortability. Yeah. I think that's an important message for us in our day today. And I want you to hear me also here that boasting is not a condoning of sin, but it's a yielding to the Lord's power. It's not the glorification of our weakness. It's not glorifying our weaknesses where we celebrate our weaknesses for their own sake, like it's a competition or a kind of victim Olympics where I'm weaker than you are. Right? It's, it's not about glorifying our weaknesses. It's about glorifying the power of Christ working in and through those weaknesses and showing his strength and his power. And that brings us to a final point that we must not miss. Ultimately, we see in verse 10 that Paul's reason for boasting is for Christ, for the sake of Christ or in Christ's behalf. Also emphatic, it actually ends the sentence in the original language. All of this is for Christ's sake. We embrace our weakness as the privileged place of our identification with Jesus Christ. You see, Paul's experience of weakness allows him to more fully inhabit, embody, and identify with the sufferings of Jesus. This is so core to Paul's life and theology. And this was an explicit part of Paul's call to ministry. He who once persecuted Christ now bore the very marks of Christ's own suffering in his own body, beaten in the very same ways as Jesus, yet five times over. And these culturally shameful marks, the scars of a, of a slave, not the wounds of a warrior, identified Paul intimately with the very sufferings of Jesus Christ. And in the Lord's economy, these were badges of glory. And so it is for us. This, my friends, is an invitation to cruciformity, to conform to our crucified Savior in the midst of our weakness because Christ is glorified when resurrection power is demonstrated in the cross-shaped parts of our lives. And this testifies to the gospel, and therefore we can boast in our weaknesses. So what is Paul doing here in this passage? Here and throughout First and Second Corinthians, Paul is redefining strength in terms of the cross, in terms of the crucified and resurrected Christ, and he is turning our own view of power on its head. Receive the Lord's very personal and beautiful words to Paul and to us this morning in the place of our thorn and weakness. Sufficient, enough, is my grace for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. And respond in agreement with Christ, like Paul did. When I am weak, then I am strong. Would you say that with me? When I am weak, then I am strong. Do you believe that this morning? It's an important question. Sometimes we're not honest with ourselves about what we actually believe. You see, the real question here is not one of strength versus weakness, but ultimately a question of whose strength. Divine strength realized through my weakness as my weakness becomes the channel of Christ's strength. And faithful discipleship, faithful discipleship, often will look like showing up in weakness, perhaps crawling on hands and knees, but trusting God to show up in power. And I can testify to you this morning from my own life that this indeed is true as the Lord has shown up over and over and over again in the broken cracks of my weakness, in the cracks of my brokenness. This is not the way of the world, but God's word calls us to a counter-cultural posture of humility and brokenness as Christ's body. And as disciples and ministers of Jesus, the incarnate God, he calls us to put on flesh and to acknowledge our own humanity, which I might say is wonderfully freeing. <laughs> so what thorn do you need to acknowledge this morning? Are you feeling weak? Perhaps weary at the start of this new semester? Weighed down by the burden of sin and temptation? Unable to obey the Lord in your own strength? Maybe you're discouraged or disheartened 
that what, by what feels like the enemy's unrelenting affliction. Or you just feel like you can't. <laughs> you can't. You've got nothing. <laughs> You're spent. What purpose of God do you need to recognize in your weakness this morning? Or in the thorn that persistently remains? And what would it look like this morning for you to boldly receive the grace and the strength of Christ in the place of your weakness? To stop denying or resisting that reality and to instead perceive the beauty of brokenness that invites us to encounter Christ more fully. Because this is an invitation. It's an invitation to meet the Lord in your thorn to embrace his presence and his enablement in all of your weaknesses. Will you accept the Lord's invitation this morning? Because sufficient is his grace for you. His power is perfected in your weakness for Christ's sake and his glory. Amen.